Our Heavenly Father, we, we quiet our souls before you. And Father, we thank you for the remarkable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from your grace, Father, we would have no hope. Apart from the cross of Christ, we remain dead in our sins. But because of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, because he is victorious for all of us who are in Christ Jesus, we boast not in ourselves, but we boast in him because we know that we have the victory because of all that he is and all that he has done. Lord, I ask and pray that as we look at your word today, that your Holy Spirit would take your word and that you would speak powerfully to us, that we might be in awe of Jesus. And Father, I pray that we would respond, each of us, to you as we need to today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Henry Martin, or Henry Martin, depending upon how you would pronounce uh, his name, there are various uh, pronunciations, was a missionary to the peoples of India and Persia, who died at the age of 31 in 1812. And he wrote these words, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more missionary we become. I've always loved that quote, and with the Annie Armstrong video, you see this, and you might say, well, why is this? Why the closer we get to Christ, the more we have that heart? Because our God is a missionary God, and Jesus Christ undertook the greatest mission in the history of all of humanity, and we're going to be discussing his mission in our Easter sermon series, which we begin today. Jesus Christ had a very clear mission, and he gave everything to accomplish it. So that when we are born again and we come to faith in Christ and the nearer we draw to him, his mission becomes our passion. He's commissioned us because of that mission. So what was the mission of Jesus? What did those who knew him best have to say about his mission? What did Jesus himself say about his mission? And did he accomplish his mission? And some of you might be saying, well, okay, all of that's interesting, but what relevance does that have for me? It's a question I pray that we will be answering every single time that we look at a text in our Easter sermon series. How could something that happened 2,000 years ago be the most significant life issue for every single person who is here or who is watching today? It is. There is no greater issue than responding to the Lord Jesus Christ in your entire life. It will affect and determine everything. Not only about your present, but your eternity. This is the most significant issue. It's not a big issue. It's not just an important issue. Again, this is the biggest issue in your life and in mine. So we start off by taking a look at Jesus' earthly ministry. When he first is on the scene to begin his ministry. And the first witness that we have today to the mission of Jesus is a man we encounter by the name of John the Baptist. Now, well, John the Baptist had a very unique role. He was the one who came in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to announce that Messiah had come to point God's people to Messiah, to make everyone ready to receive him. And John the Baptist has been preaching. He's been preaching, he's been what you might call hellfire and brimstone. He's been preaching repentance thundering from the desert, calling people to repent and to turn to the Lord. And he's been baptizing. His baptism is it was a different baptism. It was a baptism of repentance. So all who came were demonstrating that they were repenting and preparing their heart to make way for the Lord. So the masses are coming to him to be baptized. And the Jewish leaders are curious because John, if you know him, John the Baptist was no ordinary looking person. He was the last of the prophets from the Old Testament since. And he was, uh, yeah, he was preaching thunder. He was calling down thunder. And they wanted to know, who are you? Who is this? Are, are you the Messiah? And John the Baptist said, no, I'm not. I'm not him. Are you the prophet? No, I'm 
He kept pointing away from himself. And then the next day, we read the following. John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he points people to Jesus. That is what we're all called to do. John chapter 1. We're going to see the mission of Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. We will read this text in its entirety, and then we will break it down into sections. The next day, he, being John the Baptist, now this is, I need to say this in case there's confusion. We need to distinguish between the Apostle John, who, who, who wrote the Gospel of John, and John the Baptist, who are not the same person. Okay? I don't want anyone to be confused. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You might want to underline verse 29. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen... And have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now, John says amazing things about Jesus in this passage. Now, the mission of Jesus is actually found in verse 29. And we're going to, there are several different passages we will look at in our Easter sermon series that will highlight various aspects of Jesus' mission. But underline verse 29, and guess what? We're actually going to come back to verse 29 to unpack that. Because there are some other things in this passage that John says about Jesus that are absolutely stunning, unbelievably important, things we must understand. So when we look at these and when we understand them and we come back to verse 29, we're going to say, that is the Lamb of God. And we will be, I pray, amazed by God's grace. We need to know who this Jesus is first. First, John says that Jesus is not only greater than him, But Jesus is someone altogether different from him. This is very significant, again, because the Jewish leaders were looking at John the Baptist, and the Jewish people were actually confused at times, and they were wondering, you're great, we can clearly tell, God's hand is on you, we can tell, but are, are, are you him? And John is going to make some very clear distinctions. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who, please note this word, ranks, ranks before me, because he Underline this, was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, some of you might be saying, wait, isn't John the Baptist Jesus' cousin? So how did he not know Jesus? And we'll actually come back to that. We'll address that briefly in case you're, you're, you're tripping over that, okay? We'll come back later. John says to uh, first that Jesus ranks before me. Now, in this whole passage, the Greek is actually really is, is complicated, I'll just kind of put it there. So the wording of word for word trying to get that to our English is complicated. But what John is saying is this. When he says he ranks before me, if we can just go ahead and paraphrase this so we all understand, he's saying Jesus is greater and more excellent than me. He is saying that Jesus also was before me, and this is the absolute huge statement. And this is where the Greek is really difficult for, uh, to, 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 to translate, but the expositor's Greek New Testament commentary points out something very simple. John the Baptist is emphasizing Jesus' preexistence. This is no ordinary man. This is exactly what the Gospel of John Itself, The gospel of John teaches about Jesus all throughout the gospel. Jesus is not created. He has always been. The apostle John affirms this about Jesus. Now, you look at, just flip over to John 1, 1 through 3. And this is all over the place in John. 
But he wants us to know who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus is the Word. He was with God in the beginning, the beginning from our perspective. He has always existed, co-eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is not created. He has existed from eternity past. He was with God. And then John goes to say, he is God. The divine creative agent through, which, through whom all things were made. This is the one who has come to us in person. This is who John the Baptist is pointing to. This is who Jesus is. Let me go back to our passage. John says he came baptizing. And his assignment was to Baptized for a very specific reason. John said this in John, uh, in verse 31, rather. John came baptizing so that Jesus would be revealed to Israel. You see, this is John the Baptist's role in God's plan, to call God's people to repentance and to prepare them for Messiah. That was his role. Messiah must come to Israel first. He must come to the people of Israel first, and that's what's happening. So when we talk about the mission of Jesus, we first must be clear on who Jesus is. He is eternal. He is someone altogether different. He is God. John continues. Secondly, he says this about Jesus, John the Baptist. John the Baptist says that Jesus changes people from the inside out, and he is from God. Verses 31, 32, rather, and following. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is unbelievably important. John is referring to what he saw and heard at Jesus' baptism when he baptized Jesus. John may have been Jesus' cousin, but he did not fully understand who Jesus was until that baptism. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the baptism in their Gospels, all say the exact same thing. As Jesus comes out of the water, the heavens open up. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove and remains on him. And a voice from heaven, this is God the Father, says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So in John's gospel, when John the Baptist says he did not know Jesus for who he really was until he saw those signs and he heard that voice. Now, there's a contrast here between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. If you're paying attention, you will have noted that. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was baptizing a baptism of repentance, this water baptism. And John was saying, look, again, I'm not him. The one who is coming is before me. He's greater than me. He's more excellent than me. He comes from the Father. He's always existed. And unlike my baptism, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? Jesus is the one who regenerates the spiritually dead. He gives the people that have a heart of stone a heart of flesh. He changes us from the inside out. This is the gospel. So let's be clear up to this point. Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He is Messiah. He is the one the people of Israel have longed for and waited for. This is the one who God promised going back to the garden when our first parents rebelled. The one who would come to crush the works of Satan to undo the curse. The one that prophets, priests, and kings had talked about and prophesied about and foretold would come. And to drive home the point that this is not just a prophet or not just an important teacher. Thirdly, John says this in verse 34. Jesus is the Son of God. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Oh, you can't get clearer than that. This is the one who has come. This prophet John the Baptist, the voice crying out in the wilderness, the one thundering from the desert, makes straight the way for the Lord, the man who's been baptizing people and calling them to repent, to come to the Lord, to prepare for the Lord, the man that everyone has been coming to to demonstrate their repentance, to hear him preach, to be baptized, points everyone to Jesus, not to himself. 
And he said, this is the son of God, more excellent than me. He's greater than me, the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for, the one that God has promised, the ancient of days. And that's all that's going on right here. He points to Jesus. This is the son of God. So now we come back to verse 29. Now that we have looked at some of the things that John the Baptist testified about Jesus, and now we look at the mission. Verse 29, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God the Son is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away our sin. This is the mission. It's why Jesus came. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, Jews understood something, that in their sacrificial system, lambs were used as sacrifices amongst other animals, but the lamb in particular was significant. A lamb was used as the sacrifice during Passover. A lamb was offered in the daily sacrifices. And what's fascinating is that all of the Old Testament sacrifices, all of those animals, everything that was sacrificed were ultimately pointing to someone and someone greater who was to come. They were showing our need for our sins to be atoned for, our need for a sacrifice in our place. And those were all shadows pointing to something much, much greater, someone much, much greater, and that someone is Jesus. Jesus, you'll also note, is not a lamb brought by men to offer up to God as a sacrifice. No, he is the lamb of God, God's lamb, who has come down and is given to us and for us, spotless, without sin and error, absolutely perfect, and he will willingly lay down his life for our sins. Jesus is fully God, fully human, and his earthly ministry is not a contradiction. This is all over Scripture. It's a paradox. We may not understand all the mysteries of that, but Scripture affirms both. So Jesus has come to be the Lamb of God. And what's fascinating is that God will satisfy his justice with God the Son dying on the cross for you and for me, taking our place. He will take our sins upon himself. He will become a curse for us so that you and I can be forgiven. He will be the once and for all sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, the true perfect sacrifice. That's his mission to pay for our sins. That's why he came. His mission is very clear. John the Baptist said he came to take away the sins of the world. And in this context, when, Jesus, when he mentions world, John is talking about Jesus dealing with the sins of humanity in general. That's the meaning. The world does not mean that because Jesus died on the cross that everyone's sins are already forgiven. You see, that's called universalism. Jesus only saves those who call upon him. You must receive that gift. Just knowing that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of humanity does not save you. You must respond to him. Each of us must. He came to die for your sins, for my sins, to redeem for himself a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. To form a new people for himself. Now, some of you might have questions while we close. You're saying, well, why is this death needed? I mean, isn't that, I mean, we're all good people, right? I mean, people are basically good. We're going to address a few things that are not true. We are not basically good. You will not find that in Scripture. That saying, people are basically good, comes from a low view of God's holiness, his righteousness and his justice, a low view of God, period, and a high view of man. And often what we're doing is we're comparing ourselves to other people. Well, I'm not like Hitler. I'm not like Trump. People are basically good. Most people aren't Hitler. They're not Charles Manson. They're not fill in the blank. But that's the wrong standard we're measuring ourselves against. You see, God is far more holy than you and I can imagine. And our sin is far more serious, therefore, than we want to think about. Let's talk about our condition and why Jesus came. Why this sacrifice? It's interesting, in the 1970s, I believe, it was the early 70s, 
when our convention was actually in a very serious struggle and liberalism had creeped into some of our seminaries and was threatening to take over. Um, there was a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, who certainly is not teaching there any longer and has not, who wanted to do away with this bloody cross religion. Too barbaric. We're going to be enlightened. I will tell you this. Apart from the cross of Christ, apart from the shed blood of Jesus, there is no Christianity. None. There is no gospel. And you've completely changed the mission of Jesus. Why do we need someone like Jesus? Romans 3.23 says, because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a person who's honest who would ever say, oh, I've always been or I've always been a good person. I've never blown it. I've never told a white lie. I've never, I've never sinned. No, we, we have all sinned, and we know we have. And see, we come back to our standard. Our standard, again, is like, yeah, but, you know, come on. It's not that bad. I'm not like so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Again, the wrong standard. Because God is holy, there is a consequence for our sin. And Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. What we deserve and what we earn because of our sin is death. That's spiritual death now, and that is an eternity separated from God in hell. God cannot fellowship with sin because he is holy. Isaiah 59, 2 says, our sin has separated us from God. God is holy, holy, holy. He cannot fellowship with sin. And because we are sinners by nature, you can just write down Romans 3 and read the entire chapter. Because all of us are sinners by nature, because none of us does good, because none of us is actually seeking the God who is, because we've all rejected him and gone our own way, we have a serious problem. That's what Romans 3 says, that there is none who seeks after God. And someone again might say, but wait a minute. No, I, I genuinely, I, I do want to kind of know God. And, and what, what, what's being said in the gospel, I mean, in, in, in the book of Romans is this, is that none of us in our spiritually dead state seeks the God who is. We may seek a God that we want. We may seek a God of our imagination. We may seek a God who's watered down and he will say, oh, come on, you're a good, you know, you're good, you're fine. Just be a nice person, go to church every now and then. And, oh, it's all good. That's not who God is. None of us seeks after God in our spiritually dead state according to Romans chapter three. To make matters worse, Ephesians 2, 1 says that we are spiritually dead by nature. We're not drowning in the ocean hoping someone will throw us a lifeline. We are dead at the bottom. We're dead. <laughs> and unless there's a supernatural work of God, we are going to stay dead. So we have a huge problem. Dead people can't save themselves. Dead people cannot change their nature. And we can't save ourselves and work ourselves into God's good graces. This is another thing that we tend to buy into. We are hardwired in our fallen, spiritually dead state to think that, well, I'll just clean up my act and become a, a good person, and then God will forgive me. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says we cannot earn his favor, no matter what you do. You can't work hard enough. You can't do enough good deeds. Why? Because, again, he's holy, and his standard is not pretty good. His standard is absolute perfection. Meaning, we have a lot of issues going on with, our, with, who, with who we are and our problem. First of all, we have a nature we can't change. We can't. Secondly, all of us have sinned. Third, that standard is so unbelievably high, we can't reach it. No matter how many good things you started doing now, let's say that by some stretch, you could be perfect from now until the day you die. You're, you're still separated from God unless you've come to faith in Christ. Your sins have to be paid. Your, sin, your sins must be atoned for, and they have been by Christ, but you must place your faith and trust in him. And you might say, well, what is, help me understand obedience, but what, what does that look like? I will tell you, it looks like this. It means that you will always, and I will always obey God 
out of a love response to him, wanting to do all that I do for his glory. So not only my actions, but my thoughts, my motivations, my heart, everything done to please him. Every single action. I confess to you, which is not any news to you, I feel miserably in that. We might be able to outwardly try to impress one another from time to time and say, look how, look how good I am and look at the good I'm doing. But God's looking at the heart. He's looking at the motives, looking at this, that, and the other. And one little slip up and so what do you do? And that's pretty, that's pretty severe. Our reality is our problem is so severe, we need a champion. We need a savior. And Jesus is that champion. He is that champion. Savior, 1 Peter 3.18 says that he came to die for us, the just for the unjust. He's the just, by the way. So that he could atone for our sin, pay the price for our sin. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and just as in the Passover when the blood of that Lamb was sprinkled over the doorposts and the wrath of God passed over each house that was covered by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, covers our sin, shame, and guilt. And for all of us who were in Christ Jesus, God's wrath passes over us, and we are declared righteous, not because of anything we have done, but because of all that he is and has done. Everything is about Jesus. On that cross, Jesus takes our sin upon himself. He never sinned. He actually fully obeyed the Father. Did he have the possibility of sinning? Absolutely. But he didn't. He never sinned. He did everything perfect to please God. If, every, if anyone ever deserved to not pay the price for their sin, it was Jesus. But Jesus, who never ever sinned, the spotless Lamb of God, laid down his life. And on that cross, our sin, everything we have ever done, everything we've ever thought, every act of rebellion, everything we have ever done as an offense against God was heaped upon him. And the righteous, holy wrath of God the Father was poured out on God the Son. That's why Jesus was agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane, not just because of the physical pain of the cross, because he was soon going to be crying out, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was going to become a curse for you and for me so that we might be forgiven and there would be for the first time since eternity past a breach in that relationship because God the Father would have to turn his back on God the Son while he judged our sin. That's what happened on the cross. And for all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, the most remarkable thing happens. He imputes his righteousness to our account. So that when God sees us, when we stand before God, we are declared justified. In the Greek, that's a legal term meaning not guilty. Not because of who we are, but because of all that Jesus has done. His righteousness is credited to our account. And when you put it that way, all you can say is, oh, Lord, I don't deserve that. Lord, I don't deserve You see, it all of this is God's love, grace, and mercy. It's all undeserved because we all deserve judgment, and yet God loves us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you. He created you. Jesus came to set you free. This is why Jesus came. He was not just, some people say, well, Jesus was a good example. He was not just a good example, though he was the greatest example of how we are to live, who has ever lived. He's not just a wise teacher, as some would say, though he is the wisest teacher who's ever lived. And he's not just a prophet, though he is the greatest prophet who has ever lived. He is God the Son, the spotless Lamb of God, who came to take away our sins. And that is offered as a free gift. A gift is either received or rejected. 
So how do you need to respond to Christ today? If you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in a moment we're going to sing and have a time of invitation, and uh, we should have a counselor will be uh, here up at the front. Uh, if you would like to know more about following Jesus, please, just during that time of invitation, come forward and say, I would like to know more about be- being forgiven and having that relationship with God. Um, if you're watching us via live stream and you have questions about that, please send an email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com info at stonebridgesa.com, and we'll be more than glad to set a time to meet with you. If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where the Lord wants you to plant yourself and you want to know more about that, uh, you can also come forward during our time of invitation and just share, I want to join with the church, and we will set up a time to meet. And the same uh, email address if you're watching by live stream and you want to know how to connect with us. The rest of us, when we stand and sing, perhaps we are professing Christians, maybe this is that time where we ask the Lord to rekindle that sense of awe and amazement. That sense of gratitude and being blown away by the grace of God by being so thankful for Jesus Christ. Maybe you just want to worship and ask God to give you an undivided heart to once more be amazed by grace. However we need to respond to the Lord, let's do so by saying yes to him. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the remarkable gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, apart from Jesus, we would have no hope. Each and every one of us would get absolutely what we deserve. But Father, you gave your very best. You gave the most precious gift that could ever be given so that we could be forgiven. And Lord, I ask and pray that you would help all of us who are followers of Jesus to once more be amazed by grace. Forgive us, Father, for when we have taken that for granted. And Father, if there's anyone who has yet to trust Christ, I pray that today would be that day in which that gift is received. Lord, may each of us respond to you as we need to. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.